everyone. Welcome to this material characterization course. In the last class, uh, we just uh, started looking at uh, some of the uh, diffraction principles in a transmission electron microscopy. I started talking about uh, a conventional selected area diffraction as well as the convergent beam electron diffraction. And then, I, and I was saying that uh, a SAD pattern or uh, SAD pattern is obtained in a TEM using a parallel beam and uh, uh, a small probe or a micro probe or nano probe is obtained using the uh, selected, I mean um, convergent beam electron diffraction. So, we will continue that discussion and um, if you use an incident beam is convergent, the spots becomes disks and their diameters depending upon the convergent angle 2 theta or 2 alpha, something like that. You can form a convergent beam electron diffraction pattern in a TEM mode in any TEM that can produce a small probe which is less than 1 micron with convergence angle greater than 20 milli radians. So, I will just play some of the ray diagram uh, using schematic which will distinguish between a, a conventional selected area diffraction pattern and a, a convergent beam electron diffraction pattern. What you are seeing in this uh, schematic A is the a conventional electron diffraction where you have the uh, transmission transmitted beam is also called a zero or a spot and then you have the diffracted spot which is there. This is a, a conventional a parallel beam illumination. Otherwise, you have a convergent beam operation where you see that uh, there is zero order spot and you have the uh, diffracted spot which appears as a disk as compared to a spot in a conventional SAD pattern. So, this is an idea. We will talk about this and its application much more detail in the coming slides. And this is one of the uh, actual electron diffraction pattern taken from this textbook. And what it shows is uh, four different kind of patterns you get depending upon the, the angle, your angle. So, the first one is 1.4 in 10 to the power minus 3 and second one is obtained with 2.3 and third one is 4.9 and uh, fourth one is 8.1 milli radians. So, you can obtain a micro diffraction or uh, Cosell molested diffraction pattern depending upon the different converging angles. So, this is first information about the diffraction using small probes. Okay. What is important here is uh, always we talk about a probe size or a probe diameter. What is the physical meaning of this? So, in order to explain that, I brought this slide. So, the, the probe normally what we see in an, uh, in an electron microscope is nothing but a full width half maximum. So, you see that uh, you know the corresponding, you see that corresponding profile intensity profiles are shown in this here and then you have the actual image in the microscope. They will appear on the fluorescent screen like this. So, you have the, the different probe. For example, if you take uh, a spot size of 6, which will have a probe diameter of this order that is 14 nanometers, 4 nanometers and 2 nanometers and so on. You have a nano probe or a stem mode or a normal probe, you will have this kind of an intensity profile. And if you go to the HR stem, high resolution mode, you, you see that uh, the probe diameter is as small as possible nearly 10 nanometers, so which belongs to the spot size 4. So, if you, if you go to the microscope, they will give the in a dial with the numbers, which one um, each size, each number will belong to particular uh, probe diameter. The physical meaning of the probe diameter is 
a full width of maximum. So, just you have to appreciate that fact that is why I brought this slide. What is the meaning of a probe diameter? Next important thing is camera length. Uh, just now in the last class we have seen the one of the operations I mentioned that uh, we need to calibrate the camera length. We will look at the details uh, how do we get this uh, relation with the camera length and the D spacing of the specimen. So, it is a similar uh, ray diagram what we have gone through. Uh, incident beam, this is a sample and then you have the back focal plane, transmitted beam, a diffracted beam, the distance between the specimen and the back focal plane is L and then you have the 2 theta diffraction angle, the distance between the transmitted beam and the one of the diffracted beam is R. So, so the angle that the diffracted beam makes with the incident beam is 2 theta, but from the Bragg's law we know that sin theta is equal to theta, since the theta is too small which is equal to lambda by 2 d, each set of diffracting plane spacing d h k l produces a spot in the diffraction pattern at the distance r from the center and the diffraction uh, sorry and the direction perpendicular to the planes r by l is equal to r by l is equal to tan 2 theta which is approximately equal to 2 theta because theta is small. So, you can write lambda is equal to 2 d sin theta is equal to 2 d theta therefore, r d can be written as l lambda. So, this relation comes from this approximation and the camera length what we are calibrating or using is a, a projected length and not a physical distance in TEM. So, you have to be very careful about this aspect. It is always a projected length and not the physical distance in the TEM. So, you have to know this basic idea about this camera length. If lambda L is known the camera constant and relates the distance of a spot from the origin of the diffraction pattern to the d spacing of the set of planes from which it comes. The camera constant can be determined using a standard and hence the d spacing corresponding to a reflection can be found once r has been measured. So, this is the experimentally uh, measured quantity from the uh, film or from the diffraction image you measure the distance r and if you use a nanometer unit of for uh, d spacing then the unit of a camera constant is nanometer mm which is not a standard unit, but it is convenient for determining the d values in the nanometer scale. So, we will uh, we will appreciate this a uh, simple uh, concept when we actually try to index some of the diffraction pattern using a camera camera length as well as the a corresponding uh, distance r from a given pattern. So, this is the a typical uh, calibration, uh, I, again I am repeating this, the d spacing in nanometer of the first 9 diffraction rings from uh, gold and aluminum, both are uh, you know face centered cubic lattice. So, you can have this values for the reference and this is a calibration chart. We will come back to this when we do an exercises, then that will be that will make more sense rather than I will go through this values. Now, I will come back to the, the, the reciprocal lattice concept, which I talked about uh, I, during the fundamentals of uh, electron optics as well as the, I mean fundamental of this course itself we discussed about this. This is the second time you are seeing this image. And uh, the, as such the reciprocal lattice concept has been discussed again uh, in, a, in x ray diffraction, here also it is the same. Just to have much more confidence, let us go through this. Uh, what you are seeing is an, an optical uh, diffraction pattern taken from the uh, grid. Grid is nothing but uh, kind of mesh. Uh, it could be a metallic mesh or it could be of any material made of any material. It is like a, something related to something similar to grating, it is a mesh. So, the pattern A, B, C, 
D and E, they are all optical uh, diffraction pattern obtained from the grating. The pattern A from a grating with a spacing of 0.126 mm, pattern B from a 100 mesh grid with the spacing of 0.25 mm, pattern C from a 200 mesh grid with a spacing of 0.125 mm, pattern D from a 400 mesh grid with a spacing of 0.0625 mm. Pattern E, a pattern from the 2D crystal shown in F. So, what you have to appreciate here is the there is a relationship between the distance between the spot in a diffraction pattern to the, the grid spacing, there is a relationship. So, you can appreciate that the as the spacing in the grid decreases, the distance between the spot increases. So, this is a, a reciprocal relation here. So, we can make some statement about based on this observation. There is a definite relationship between a periodicity and orientation of the object and the spacing and orientation of the spots in the diffraction pattern. So, the diffraction pattern is known as a reciprocal lattice because of the inverse relationship it bears to the direct lattice that is the object. So, we have seen this already. I will just uh, play some animation. So, what you are seeing in this animation is uh, this is a, a, a undeviated beam from the specimen and this is a diffracted beam here and what what is shown in this uh, right hand head right hand head image is the intersection of two planes plane 1 and plane 2 and this is the, the electron beam and this is the screen on which you see the diffraction spots appearing here and I want you to look at this schematic much more carefully because you see that a plane 1 is drawn in one color and plane 2 is drawn in another green color and the, the diffracted spot corresponding to plane 1 and plane 2 are also indicated with the same color of the plane. So, you see that a plane 2, you see the diffracted spot appearing in the this line which is 90 degree to the plane orientation. You can see that it is 90 degree to the plane orientation, either this side or that side. Similarly, you look at the plane 1, the diffraction, diffracted spot appears exactly on that space which is 90 degree to the plane 1 orientation. So, this is very important and for a clarity only two planes are shown here. In principle, you can have n number of planes or it could be more planes also where a diffraction can occur and then you will see the corresponding uh, diffracted spot in the uh, screen like this. Now, we will take you to uh, an another concept which is very important uh, in analyzing the uh, diffraction pattern called a stereographic projection. So, like you have uh, an, an atlas where all the you know countries regions are drawn in one scale they are all called uh, you know area true projections. Here you have an angle true projections. So, stereographic projections are called angle true projections similar to atlas where you have area true projections. So, the idea of uh, the stereographic projection is uh, what you are seeing on the screen is like you assume that you assume that you are placing a small uh, cubic crystal inside the center of the sphere and uh, and you try to draw a normal to this cube uh, and then which comes and intersects, intersects the 
uh, surface of the sphere and each one is uh, each one plane normal which comes out and hits the surface of the sphere from the center is called a poles each one poles. So, I will just show one very nice uh, uh, animation where you will appreciate what I am trying to say. You imagine that I have kept one a cubical crystal inside the sphere. Now, the assume that the sphere is transparent and I have just put that into a 0, 0, 1 orientation uh, from this from the uh, I mean the plane of the screen uh, the perpendicular the plane normal of the screen itself 0, 0, 1. So, in that projection I have put the uh, crystal inside the sphere. Now, I will try to rotate this sphere you will appreciate what I am trying to say. You see that uh, the crystal each plane plane normal which comes and uh, intersects the surface of the sphere you can see these are all poles individual poles. So, the top one is 1 0 0 the bottom one is the opposite in fact it should be bar 1 0 0 here it is 0 0 1 and the opposite side is you can see that 0 0 bar 1 you can see that. So, like that you have all opposite uh, poles here and there. The idea is if you represent your uh, I mean a plane and the directions with this we will be able to analyze the uh, crystal crystallographic orientation much more easily. So, I have just shown one uh, simple thing you can look at this kind of a projection system and as I just mentioned all these poles and which will have a perpendicular I mean particular angle for example, 1 0 0 and 0 1 0 will have a 90 degree and 1 1 0 and 0 1 0 will have about 45 degree. So, like that you can uh, you can just visualize the uh, angle between two plane normals. So, that means you will be able to identify the angle between the planes and then you will be able to represent the, the crystal crystallography orientation much more easily. And then we will use this concept to uh, I mean explain some of the reciprocal uh, lattice concept as well as some evolved sphere concepts we will use it. And uh, this, this is just for your introduction just you have to just imagine how this uh, uh, stereographic projection uh, can be viewed in all these 4, 5 directions. So, you can see all the important uh, poles are indexed and then how they rotate. So, now after uh, going through this I, I believe that you have some idea about this what is stereographic projection. So, now what you are seeing is all a 2D projection what I have just shown is an animation is a 3D. So, this is the same thing what I have shown 0 0 1 projection I have shown it is represented in the 2D like this. So, this is the stereographic projections for a, a cube crystal with 0 0 1 parallel to the south north direction the sphere of the figure figure stereographic projection is 0 1 0 is parallel to the east west. So, this is what it is shown here. So, here how you can just look at the uh, some of the poles are written here this is a the some of the nomenclature which I am not uh, going into the detail and uh, the basic idea I, I want to show it here is in a using the stereogram you will be able to represent the crystallographic direction that is all I would like to say and uh, if uh, time permits we will uh, solve some small problems using the stereographic relation and also uh, try to plot some of the uh, poles on a 
on a graph like this, uh, see a wolf net divided into two degree divisions, you can actually plot uh, some of the poles and then try to do some kind of an exercise uh, of rotating each pole, what will happen and what kind of stereographic projections you will be able to visualize, that we can do it. And uh, I am introducing this uh, technique as a, a tool which, which can be, uh, with this tool we can represent the orientation of the crystal much more uh, clearly. That is that's the information I want to give at this point of time. And when we actually go through some of the exercises or solving the tutorial problems, we will be able to appreciate how this tool can be used. So, this is just for one uh, references where some of the poles are being uh, rotated here and uh, you can appreciate that uh, how the angle true projections is very effectively uh, represented in a, a two, 2D fashion, that is the basic idea. And uh, this is a standard stereographic projection for a cubic structures, one is uh, 0, 0, 001 and uh, 110, C111 and D112. So, here is this, there is only one projection is shown here, but other projections I have not shown. And uh, what you are seeing here is, this is uh, for a, a 0001 projection for uh, cubic system, where all this uh, spot shows the, the parallel orientations of uh, uh, another system like this and uh, suppose if you look at the stereo projection of, of both uh, BCC and FCC, their poles are indexed like that. So, you will be able to uh, measure the angle between the two poles of the different crystal system here and uh, for example, some of the poles are very closely parallel that means 0 1 1 of BCC is parallel to 1 1 1 of FCC or 1 1 1 of BCC is parallel to 0 sorry 1 0 1 of FCC and 2 1 1 of BCC is parallel to 1 2 1 of FCC something like that you can you can see all these things are uh, if they are exactly parallel both of them both the points will coincide and if it is not parallel, then you can see that how far they are away from each uh, uh, plane. That means, uh, the angle will tell you the orientation of each uh, plane. That means, you can uh, relate uh, yeah, the plane which is, uh, suppose if you have a two phase system, one is a BCC and an FCC, you will be able to relate the, the parallel planes of the two systems. So, when they are in parallel parallel to each other, then you will form, uh, the, you will obtain a diffraction pattern straight. So, that means, uh, because diffraction patterns are obtained only when the planes are parallel to each other. So, by looking at the stereogram, you will be able to identify the poles which are parallel. That means, the plane normals are parallel, then that in actual physical meaning, it is the planes are parallel and then you will get a a corresponding diffraction pattern in a, a back focal plane, you will be able to analyze both the patterns and then you, are, you will be able to correlate the relationship between or the orientation relationship between the two crystals using this uh, uh, stereographic projection. So, that is the basic idea about this uh, stereographic projection. I do not want to get into the detail due to the lack of time, but you should know why this is being used. When a number of planes are parallel to a single direction, they are said to constitute a zone and the common direction is the zone axis or a zone direction. For example, if you go to uh, this uh, particular zone, for example, 0, 0, 1, what are all the parallel uh, directions you will be able to identify? with this stereogram. So, when you say a zone axis, so you will be able to identify number of planes that are parallel to the single direction, which can be easily identified by using stereographic projection. 
the indices HKL of all the spots in this pattern are related to the indices of the zone axis U, V, W to which the beam is parallel by the V's zone law. So, you have the very powerful uh, uh, I mean relationship which is given by V's zone law. You can ident identify the HKL and uh, HKL of the spots in a pattern and it is zone axis. They will have the relations like this HU plus KV plus LW is equal to 0. So, this using this relation you will be able to identify some of the planes which are parallel to this zone. So, this is very powerful uh, law and we will be able to we will be using this relation when we index some of the diffraction pattern and finding out the parallel planes. Now, what I will do is uh, I will again uh, come back to this reciprocal lattice. What you are now seeing is a schematic uh, animation where you have the, the real lattice and it is relation with the corresponding reciprocal lattice here. You will be able to draw this physically because all that you need to know the information about for example, it is 1 by d of 1 0 0 plane which is equal to 1 by a or 1 by d 2 0 0 type of plane is equal to 2 by a and then the angle between them. So, you will be able to draw physically when you have the, the basic information uh, from the real lattice. For example, this is a and this is b and this is a d spacing you will be able to generate this kind of a, a reciprocal lattice of your wall. Similarly, you can do it in a 3D because we know the relation. So, this is just give you an idea. Please remember in an electron diffraction uh, experiment even in a TEM what you generate uh, in a microscope is a a three dimensional reciprocal lattice, but you project it on a, a 2 D screen. So, you get only the 2 D information. So, because in a please understand in a transmission electron microscope it is a your crystal is transparent to the electron beam. So, you get a 3 D information it is a three dimensional information, but of course, as I mentioned in the beginning it is an averaged information, but you get the uh, projection on the uh, a 3D information projected on a 2D screen and which is uh, uh, seen as a spot. We will get into the details why it appearing like a spot, what is the physical meaning of the spot and so on in the due course. So, this is again uh, a reciprocal lattice construction for a monoclinic crystal. So, you can try one of this. Uh, systems because you know the basic relationship between the real crystal and the reciprocal lattice system. So, this can this can be a good exercise if you do uh, as a an exercise for few systems then your uh, a ability to analyze this uh, reciprocal lattice or a diffraction pattern will be a manifold. You will be more comfortable if you theoretically solve and then uh, get into the uh, selection rule and then see that which are the spots will be allowed and which are the spots will be not allowed. You can mark them and then if you if you can have the uh, a basic idea of uh, calculating this theoretically, then you will have much more confidence in analyzing the electron diffraction pattern, which I will show with some few examples on a, uh, on a, on a blackboard or a tutorial class, then you will appreciate this. So, this is just for your information. This is for a hexagonal uh, crystal lattice. You have the uh, a reciprocal lattice system. And another important thing is when you uh, index the reciprocal lattice, then you have the a kind of 180 degree ambiguity. So you have what I what what is the schematic showing is suppose if you have a set of spots where which you have indexed with one type of an indices and if you rotate this like this, 
then the indices should be different. You can see that indices are opposite. So, uh, you have to confirm this. It is not that once you rotate this, the indices are having different sign. It is not completely wrong, but then there is an ambiguity. You have to fix this, uh, which particular uh, correct indices is given. Uh, we will talk about it when we do an uh, indexing exercise. So, this is coming because of the uh, uh, symmetry. And this is some of the single crystal electron diffraction pattern for a primitive cubic system. Uh, these are all available in the literature. Uh, in most of the books, electron diffraction book, you will find it. Uh, you will be able to, suppose if you, you are able to find out the ratio from your electron diffraction pattern, you can directly, uh, directly see this kind of an index pattern here, then you will be able to transfer these indices to your uh, system. If it is, if it is a cubic system and if you are able to match the angle between the uh, each, I mean the orientation and the spacing and the ratio, everything matches, then you will be able to use this kind of uh, an indexing system. Nevertheless, it is better to uh, calculate of your own and index. I will demonstrate in couple of uh, exercises. It is always better to uh, do it, do a calculation and do it, but in now the, if, if it is a well known system like the cubic system, there is nothing wrong in uh, looking at this pattern and then look at the solutions. So, I will skip this, these are all basic uh, information. The, the another important point I want to emphasize here is, uh, whatever we have just seen so far is a, a single crystal electron diffraction pattern. What you are now seeing is a, a diffraction pattern from a polycrystalline material. So, what you are seeing instead of a spots, you are you are able to see uh, rings here. So, if a area of the specimen selected by the diffraction aperture contains a crystal in several orientations, the diffraction pattern will consist of sum of individual patterns. In the case where the specimen consists of very many crystals of random orientation, the spots are so close together that they fall on a series of continuous rings. So, what does it mean? Uh, you, you have an, a single crystal pattern uh, of a different orientation, whatever we have just seen. Some of the, I have just showed as uh, for a cubic systems, FCC, BCC and HCP systems is that they are all single crystal. That means, a diffraction is occurring from a, a single crystal or a single grain. When you, when your aperture focusing a region, which that region contains a lot more a crystal, single crystals or the crystals oriented in much more random positions or orientations, then your diffraction will be not a spot, but a ring because the pattern will consist of a sum of all individual patterns. Suppose, if you put all the patterns together, then that will form, fall in the, the ring. So, all the individual or independent orientations that can be put or superimposed, that is why it is called sum of individual patterns, then you will find a, a ring pattern. That means, the physical meaning is all the, uh, you know, the many crystals of random orientations will contribute to the uh, diffraction conditions. That is all it means. Suppose, if you look at the uh, basic diffraction conditions, that means, you have all the orientations, that means, many, many crystals are obeying the uh, Bragg conditions and then contributing to the diffraction intensity. That is all it means. So, now, this is one uh, simple example. Uh, uh, of uh, how to use this camera constant to identify the uh, single electron, I mean single crystal electron diffraction pattern. So, this is a, a diffraction pattern from a feldspar, which is a C phase centered triclinic uh, crystal structure. So, the electron diffraction pattern appears like this. The camera constant for this uh, particular uh, feldspar is lambda L is equal to 3.6 nanometer millimeter. 
this is uh, this is how you have to do the measurement from the center that is a transmitted beam to the diffracted beam is R1, this is an R2. So, R1 is about 9.5 mm and R2 is 6.35 mm. Using the relations, you can lambda L is equal to Rd, D1 is equal to 0.379 nanometers, D2 is equal to 0.567 nanometers. So, like that, we can readily uh, index this. Uh, electron diffraction button provided the camera constant is calibrated and well known. Otherwise, this kind of indexing procedure is not valid. I will show some of the other uh, procedures of indexing the diffraction pattern in some of the tutorial class. So, now we will uh, look at uh, the how the uh, Evolved sphere is uh, related to uh, a reciprocal lattice. So, the evolved sphere it links the reciprocal lattice to the Bragg law. This we have already seen in an X ray diffraction uh, phenomenon. Just to recall, you see that uh, this is a evolved sphere, and here you have this sample incoming ray. This is a transmitted beam, and this is a diffracted beam for this geometry. The, the radius is 1 by lambda and then you can write uh, sin theta for this uh, geometry O p by O x which is equal to 1 by d divided by 2 by lambda or 2 d sin theta is equal to lambda. This is simply a Bragg law uh, derivation from this uh, schematic. So, what it signifies? The signification is, so wherever the, the evolved sphere cut through the lattice, the wherever the reciprocal lattice point exactly intersects with the uh, surface of the sphere, then you will, though only those spots will appear in the uh, diffraction pattern. What is the physical meaning? Only those spots will satisfy the Bragg law. So, that is, that is why only those spots are appearing in the uh, diffraction pattern, not the other pattern. Now, we can also look at this uh, Bragg law using this uh, vector equation. So, you have the evolved sphere and uh, this is an incident uh, beam that is a k naught and this is a diffracted beam with vector k and this is the g vector that is a diffraction vector and g is equal to k minus k naught. So, this is a, a vector equation alternative to the Bragg's law is shown like this. This geometry is more appropriate for X-ray diffraction where the wavelength is of the same order of the magnitude as an atomic dimension. So, that is the only difference and what you are now going to see in animation is a very interesting animation. You see that uh, <coughs> as I mentioned that in the beginning of the uh, today's uh, lecture uh, or when I talked about the difference between an X-ray diffraction and a, or electron diffraction, the only difference is the wavelength, one of the important aspect of uh, the diffraction between X-ray and electron. So, here you see that I uh, will play this animation again. What you see, you are now the evolved sphere is so big that you know most of your uh, diffracted spot are falling exactly on the periphery of this evolved sphere. So, you are able to see the many number of spots in an electron diffraction pattern as compared to X-ray diffraction pattern. In X-ray diffraction pattern, you see only few peaks, uh, not so many uh, number of peaks as you see in an uh, electron diffraction pattern, you have n number of spots uh, around a transmitted uh, beam. So, that is because uh, the lambda is so small, so that 1 by lambda is uh, you know so big. So, your evolved sphere become very big and then all this uh, reciprocal lattice point are exactly intersecting the um, 
are cutting through the or I would say that evolved sphere is cutting through all the uh, reciprocal lattice points. So, you are able to see so many uh, spots around the transmitted beam. So, in electron diffraction the wavelength is two orders of magnitude smaller than X-ray diffraction. As you can see a large number of reciprocal lattice points are close to the surface of the reflecting sphere because the radius of the sphere is so large. So, that we have seen. So, the other information about this uh, reflecting sphere or evolved sphere is you have to appreciate, uh, you have to see why we see uh, a spot in, a, in an electron diffraction. So, what I really mean here is uh, the sphere, the diffraction spots are not really spots, but are elongated perpendicular to the surface of the specimen. If the specimen is of the thickness T, the reciprocal lattice point is streaked out to a length of 1 by T producing a rel rod that is a reciprocal lattice rod. So, since we are talking about a, a, a reciprocal uh, relationship in, in the diffraction intensity, so it is suppose if your specimen is having a thickness in one direction that is important. Suppose in the suppose this is the uh, specimen direction I mean and this is your electron beam. So, this is the thickness of the sample then your uh, diffraction intensities are going to be produced perpendicular to the, the, the I mean the orientation of the uh, specimen. So, that is what it is shown here. So, in the three dimension what I just mentioned before when I showed a theoretical calculation of the uh, reciprocal lattice in the three dimension. I just mentioned about the each spot in an electron microscope, I, I mean the reciprocal lattice produced in electron microscope is in three dimension and then each spot uh, uh, intensity profile depending upon the, the specimen shape. Suppose if, this, if your uh, specimen is a foil or a thin sheet of a thickness T, then your intensity profile will be perpendicular to that orientation. So, similarly you have a cubic. Uh, cubic specimen then your intensity profile will be uniform in all the three directions. So, if your sample is oriented in this direction and uh, your, uh, your, your intensity profile will be in the opposite direction. So, it is a reciprocal relationship. So, similarly if you uh, in most of the uh, conventional TEM analysis your sample is uh, a thin foil and your electron beam is passing through this thin foil perpendicular to this. So, you will see that your reciprocal actual uh, point will have a intensity profile like a, a rod that is what it is shown here. So, you actually you, you produce a rod like this in 3D since your uh, I mean evolved sphere cuts through the all the rail rod and when you cut the rod uh, in a, a cross section you will see a circle. So, that is what you see as a, a circular point. Uh, of intersection that is what is being projected on the uh, fluorescent screen that is why you see as a very small small circular spot as a, a diffraction spot in a uh, actual diffraction pattern. So, this is one of the uh, concepts you will be able to appreciate. Uh, uh, in fact, the, the, the very effective usefulness of the evolved sphere concept is this where you are able to appreciate the actual what you are seeing on a screen why it is appearing in a, a circular uh, spot. So, this is one of the usefulness. So, you can see that in the clearly in this schematic A where the, the evolved sphere cuts through the rail rod and then you, you see that that particular uh, in fact, it is not cutting in a line it is a, a complete it is a sphere. So, it is a surface. So, the whole surface cuts through the uh, a reciprocal rod in a three dimension. So, you get the a 2D surface like this what is shown in this uh, uh, schematic here. And uh, you can also appreciate that if the if the orientation of the you know your uh, reciprocal lattice is slightly different you can see that this is a, a zero order a diffraction spot and then you see the first order and second order and so on. So, so another important aspect is 
So whatever we conventionally get uh, a diffraction pattern is the a zero order uh, diffraction pattern. And uh, as we talked about in a, in a I mean uh, convergent beam electron diffraction, you, you will, you, we will see that a higher order uh, lava zones will be identified. And you can see that how these higher order zones are being uh, identified using this uh, uh, evolved sphere concept, you can see that this is a zero order, this is a first order. Suppose if I have a reciprocal lattice here, then it will appear like this, first order, second order and so on. So this is another important aspect you have to uh, remember. What you are seeing is a, a, a cross section of, uh, a, I mean a re reciprocal lattice rod in three dimension, what you see in a two dimension as a diffraction pattern. So. So, you can see that uh, some of the examples, this is a zero order zone, this is a first order in an TEM, you can see the second order, I mean this first order and second order, higher order zones are visible using this concept, you can see that the electron beam is parallel to the zone axis. The crystal has been tilted slightly with the consequence that the first order lava zone is visible. So this is a first order. For that we need to just do the tilting experiment, you will be able to appreciate this. Remember using a convergent beam electron diffraction, this experiment can be done and we will be able to identify um, higher order uh, lava zones which will enable us to characterize some of the uh, symmetry elements in a material. So we will see it when in the convergent beam electron diffraction when we take it up. So I will stop here and then uh, I will continue this uh, diffraction concept in a TEM and in the next class I will discuss the, the importance of uh, Kikuchi lines and how they are generated, what to do with the Kikuchi lines and so on. And similarly we will look at a little more detail about a convergent beam electron diffraction and its use in general. Very briefly we will look at it, if not much more detail uh, and uh, we'll, then we will move on to some of the imaging aspects of TEM. Thank you.